Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our global audience. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Akapasade, CEO of Toronto Center for Global Leadership in Financial Supervision. I am very happy to welcome uh, more than uh, 30 agencies and 40 countries that have joined us, uh, ranging all the way from Botswana to Zambia and many countries in between. So we pretty much covered most letters of the alphabet. Uh, welcome to the fourth episode of our Pandemics and Financial Inclusion. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to wrap up a little bit about what we've learned over the past uh, four, sorry, three sessions, so that the observations are more crystallized. More than 1.7 billion people worldwide remain unbanked and the majority of women. Crisis disproportionately affect the poor. The experience with past pandemics, such as Ebola indicates, the economic fallout and subsequent recovery are likely to hit women harder than men in developing countries. Yet as disruptive as COVID-19 is, it has also amplified opportunities for financial inclusion, which is critical for poverty reduction. COVID-19 has created the urgency to accelerate the need for digital payment systems as cash is considered a contaminant. Building a digital payment system is critical, but it's not just simply about building a technology platform. It requires an enabling environment with risk-based policies and supervisory frameworks to ensure consumers and other stakeholders are protected and safe from cyber attacks, privacy breaches, and money laundering. You also need to ensure regulators and supervisors are properly trained. This is where Toronto Center plays an integral role by providing much needed capacity building for supervisors and regulators in partnership with our various partners. In the past decade, we at Toronto Center have seen a steady increase in demand for our programs as countries struggle to address the challenges of building safe and accessible financial systems. While we deliver 70 to 80 programs and more than 2000 officials annually receive our training, so much more could be done if additional resources could be committed to these efforts. In today's episode, we sit down with two special guests to cover financial sector regulation and supervision, as well as the financial inclusion dimensions of this challenge. We circulated their bios to you in advance, and in the interest of time, I won't read them. Dr. Ernest Addison is the governor of the Central Bank of Ghana, and a prominent member of the international community of central bankers. I should also note for our Canadian audience, he received his PhD from McGill University where my daughter just begun uh, her studies last year. Chris Calabia is our special guest, uh, senior advisor, supervisor in regulatory policy, financial services for the poor at the Gates Foundation. He's also the former SVP at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Hello, gentlemen. We're glad you could join us today. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Finally, I would like to thank our founder, sorry, funders, uh, Global Affairs Canada, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, IMF, USAID, Jersey Overseas Aid, and Comic Relief, without whom we couldn't bring you this program and any of our capacity building efforts. Before we start, I know that many of our viewers have questions and we have a lot of time for answering your questions. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom and type your questions as soon as you can so that you can get into the queue. Gentlemen, I wanna address a question to both of you. Uh, World Bank literature uh, has highlighted that financial crises can throw millions into poverty. I shouldn't be a surprise. So all good efforts on financial inclusion can just go out the door with a major financial crisis. We still have fresh memories of the 2008 financial crisis, as well as other global and regional crises. But this one obviously feels different. So, Governor, let me ask, let me start with you. What is different in your view about this crisis? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this COVID-19 crisis is different, first and foremost, because it's a health crisis, and a health crisis that has led to an economic crisis, which is impacting people's lives and ending up also in a livelihood crisis. And I say so because even though Ghana does not have that many cases, we have about 6,000 cases of COVID-19 
the mortality rate has also been low, it has impacted the economy. It has impacted in terms of the measures that the government had to put into place to deal with, with the COVID. We've had the lockdown for nearly three weeks and we have restricted movements and significant parts of our economy has been impacted on by, by this uh, crisis. So we are seeing slower economic activity. We are seeing uh, informal sectors where people depend on going to the market every day, not being able to do that, and therefore not being able to earn an income. Now, if you are living uh, on a day-to-day -day basis through selling a product in the market and you are not able to do that because of the need for social distancing, that impacts on your ability to, to earn a living. So this is a crisis that uh, goes beyond the, the issue of the economy, which it has, even in terms of our financial flows uh, into our reserve flows as a country, we have seen the numbers go down. And apart from the, the, the macro impact, the impact on the government finances is also there. Government revenue uh, flows have gone down, but on the expenditure side, the government has had to implement some COVID-19 related expenditures to, in a sense, cushion the citizens against some of the hardships that, that we are facing. And then at the household level, we have seen, especially those who belong to the services sector being significantly impacted on. Hotels are empty, restaurants are empty, uh, informal markets are, have been empty for two weeks, and that has impacted on livelihoods. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, uh, it's important to note that while in relative terms, uh, Ghana has not had a major uh, uh, number of cases with COVID, you still live within the world community and you're impacted by the various slowdowns that are happening. So everyone is really in this together. Chris, turning to you, uh, so I'm sure you have a special vantage point as a former SVP at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, you, uh, you pretty much had a front view seat of the 2008 um, great financial crisis. And back then, I think the banks were the big culprits and uh, but what is your view now? How is this crisis different for you? Thank you, Baba. I'm honored to join the governor today and, and you with the Toronto Center Program on Pandemics. I think Governor Addison said it quite well, and that is that this is a health crisis. And that's the major difference between the COVID-19 pandemic and the 2008 crisis. And the loss of life on a heartbreaking scale is one of many factors that makes it so incomparably different from the 2008 crisis. Uh, that said, as you alluded, in 2008, I think many observers would have blamed the financial system for the, as being the source of the crisis. In 2020, the financial system might actually be part of the solution, especially in lower and middle income countries. And Babak, as you said in your opening remarks, uh, the costs of pandemics and these types of crises often fall heavily on the poor women and the unbanked and others. And if we can improve the ability of the financial system to serve society's most vulnerable members, their, their financial needs, women, the poor, and the unbanked, we may be able to help mitigate the economic hardships that they would otherwise endure. We might strengthen the government's responses to the pandemic. And this in turn could lead to better health outcomes as well. Those are of course the short-term benefits of making good decisions uh, by supervisors and central banks and governments. But we should remember from the 2008 crisis that there are long-term benefits as well sometimes from crises in, ter in terms of the response to the crisis, excuse me, not, not, not from the crises themselves, but the responses to the crises. And we know that in 2008, uh, we introduced some new tools. And so for me as a, as a frontline supervisor, one of the most important tools that we introduced in 2008 was the, uh, input, the development of stress testing, a new tool that allowed us to look forwards and to imagine how banks balance sheets might perform if we couldn't flatten the curve, if you will, of rising losses across so many different asset classes and rising unemployment. And even after the financial crisis, we found stress testing to be a useful tool, especially for larger banks, because it allowed us to look forwards rather than to look back at past results. And so I think that as supervisors and central bankers think about their responses to the pandemic, they should try to think strategically as well and recognize that some of the decisions that they make could leave the financial system in a stronger position and a more, make it a more inclusive financial system as well. Chris, and also it's important to keep in mind that there's a lot of discussion today about uh, going back to reopening. Many U.S. states are beginning to talk about that and some other countries as well. 
But if you, if you really think about it, it's really trying to embark on a new normal. I would like to ask my colleague, Diana, to please put up a notice of an event that we are organizing. It's basically supervising the new normal. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of uh, insensitive to talk about recovery so soon when the debt rates are still climbing, albeit at a slower rate, but there are a lot of challenges here. So I encourage uh, our viewers to also tune in to our next session, which is on uh, May the 26th. We have three prominent speakers, uh, a senior official from the WHO, uh, the chair of our board, uh, Dr. Stefan Ingves of Riksbank, and Sokora Heisen, uh, the head of supervision in Peru, who's also a member of our board of directors. We'll delve into those issues. And as Chris said, we have to look forward into to a new system, but perhaps it is a new normal. Thank you very much, Diana. Governor, turning back uh, to you, uh, looking at the current situation, with COVID-19 pandemic spreading globally and central banks responding to the situation by taking different regulatory measures, what policies and supervisory decisions have you taken to reduce its impact on the financial sector and businesses in Ghana? And while you answer that question, you're also plugged in to the community of central bankers within Africa and elsewhere. So if any other broader observations you have, we very much would welcome that. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I think our response in Ghana is not different from what the global response, global monetary policy response has been. First, to try to reduce our policy rates. We've reduced our policy rate from 16% to 14.5%, hoping that that would uh, signal an easing of monetary policy. Uh, we have also reduced uh, reserve requirements for banks uh, from 10 to 8%. Uh, we reduced the capital conservation buffer for banks by from 3 to 1.5%. And we have also relaxed the provisioning requirements for selected loans. Now, this is because we had taken earlier measures which we think had strengthened the financial sector. And, and our broad macro policy in general. Inflation had come down. We were beginning to see fairly robust growth prior to this uh, crisis coming in. So in Ghana, we did have the policy space to reduce the policy rates and reduce uh, reserve requirements. I know there are other African countries uh, that did not have the advantage in terms of where they were prior to the crisis. And Zambia was one of those countries where they have not been able to use the policy rate or reserve requirements to, to counteract the, the impact of, of this crisis on the economy broadly. In addition to that, uh, we also had to look at the issue of digital payments, which became very important because uh, people had to stay at home and, and therefore uh, trying to undertake transactions using uh, digital means became very important during the period. In Ghana, mobile money is one of the more important digital forms of payments. So we decided to increase uh, mobile money wallet transactions and, and waive some of the charges on mobile money accounts. Uh, below transactions that were below 100 CDs, for example, were made free. And that we thought had a major impact on, on financial inclusion because quite a lot of people without bank accounts in Ghana do have mobile money accounts. And therefore being able to reduce the charges in a sense facilitated uh, that segment of, of, the, of the sector. In addition to that, we also asked banks not to pay dividends for two years, that is 2019. And 2020, in a sense, to conserve capital uh, in anticipation of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of an outlook in which uh, loans might not be performing effectively. We do foresee a situation where impairments to, to credits in, in the financial sector could be higher, and therefore we requested the banks to conserve capital in that sense. The banks themselves were also asked to give some moratorium on, on, on debt servicing. So we've had six months uh, debt service moratorium for, for customers of, of banks 
And then for customers that are operating particularly in the service sectors and the hospitality industry. So broad, a broad range of policy measures aimed at first dealing with the macro part of it, and then also trying to ease the burden of, of transacting digitally. Thank you very much uh, uh, for laying that out. And I'm sure we're gonna come back to that again. Uh, Chris, uh, you bring an interesting perspective. We did talk about your supervisory background and also obviously at the Gates Foundation. So COVID-19 has created particularly challenging times for developing economies that the Gates Foundation works with. How can supervisors and central banks best address these challenges? So, Babak, uh, as uh, you may know from the press, uh, many central bankers and many supervisors will emphasize the need to stabilize the financial system in the short run. And I think that's completely appropriate. We want banks and other types of financial service institutions to operate normally, as normal as possible, to safeguard deposit savings, and to continue to serve as an intermediary of credit to businesses and consumers in the marketplace. And when financial institutions do those jobs well, that can help to mitigate the impact on vulnerable populations. There are, though, three areas, I think, where many supervisors, including in Ghana, are focusing attention as well. And Governor Addison alluded to some of these points as well, and I'm happy to, to emphasize them a little, a little bit more detailed. And so, first of all, as the governor mentioned, uh, there are people still in many countries, about 1.7 billion people worldwide, who lack access to a financial services account of some kind. And we need to enroll more of these people into financial services accounts so that they can uh, benefit from financial services during the pandemic and then also from government related programs. And so, for example, some governments are making cash transfers or COVID-19 related relief payments to their citizens who've been furloughed or to small businesses and so on. And in order to receive those payments, digital financial payments can be a very safe and effective way of getting them. It reduces the need for individuals to line up in large crowds at say government offices or bank branches and so on, and reduces the need for them to, uh, to, to be in close proximity to each other during a, the time of a, a pandemic. But if you think long-term, when people have access to these financial services accounts, they're better able to engage in the formal economy. They're able, better able to make payments and receive payments in the future. They're better able to save and invest in their families' futures. And eventually they're better able to borrow too as they develop a credit history and so on. And so this is one area where you can have a very long-term effect when you think about a short-term response to the pandemic. A second thing in many lower and middle income countries is that we need to think more about the entire financial system. And one challenge in some parts of the world is that in rural or impoverished areas, you can't find a bank branch or an ATM anywhere. But you can almost always find someone who sells a mobile phone or a SIM card or will pay, you can pay to top up airtime on your mobile phone. And about 15 years ago, the idea of relying on mobile phones to provide financial services really took off first in places like Kenya or the Philippines and now are, have been deployed in many lower and middle income countries around the world. And one one uh, very important part of these mobile money or mobile wallet uh, transactions is that it's difficult to get cash into the system or out of the system is if there isn't an access point nearby. And because there are these stores that sell phones or people who sell airtime, in many countries, these third parties are allowed to receive funds from consumers and then deposit them into digital accounts on their behalf. And these third parties are called agents. And the pandemic, I think, is renewing attention on the need to ensure that there are agents and they can function in the marketplace. Uh, many countries are beginning to recognize them as essential workers, meaning that they can work during the pandemic and provide cash in and cash out services to people who rely on mobile wallets and so on. Um, but that also means that they need access to health information. And in some countries, simply soap and running water or, or clean water so that their, con con their customers can wash their hands when they come in to deposit cash or to withdraw cash. So thinking a little bit more about the incentives that exist for people to become agents and making it possible for them to serve their function is important both during the pandemic and afterwards. The last area I'd mentioned is that, uh, as you know very well from your work at the Toronto Centre, supervision is an intensely hands-on profession. We spend a lot of time sending people out into firms to look very closely at their books and records, to interview people, and to conduct on-site inspections and so on. And in a pandemic, you don't want to do that necessarily. You don't want to deploy people into the field. But the challenge is that in some countries, financial institutions have difficulty getting the information to the central bank or to the regulatory authority because they don't have electronic ways of 
or, or the capacity to upload, say, regulatory returns and reports to the central bank or to the supervisory authority. And even in those countries where they can do that, in some cases, the central bank staff or the supervisors may not have the ability to access those records from outside of the central bank from home if they need to work from home. And so the investments that supervisors and central banks are making today to develop things like secure web portals or APIs that allow financial institutions to upload data straight into the systems of the central bank or supervisory authority and the investments in the telecommunications infrastructure to ensure that people can work remotely and including supervisors and central bankers from home when necessary. These are things that will pay dividends in the long run as well and lead to a more efficient and potentially more effective approach to supervision and a healthier financial system after the pandemic. Thank you very much, Chris. <clears throat> you laid the waterfront out really, really concisely, and I really appreciate that. A couple of observations on the points you made was in one of the earlier uh, uh, episodes, uh, our good partner, Greta Bull of CGAP, was mentioning to me that this uh, getting payment to people is so challenging that this one world government has decided to mobilize their military to actually take bundles of cash and hand them out to people, right? So we see to the extremes that people go. So what you say is very appropriate. And one of the points I wanna <clears throat> touch base on was uh, you mentioned supervisor, supervision is very much a hands-on business. We call it a relationship business. It's very true. And there's a lot of challenge and we have been able to offer a lot of virtual programs and trainings for supervisors and including helping them do virtual uh, on-site supervision as well. So it's something that is really ongoing and it's very appropriate for the times. So thank you for laying this out. Governor, if I can turn back to you, please. Um, how has COVID-19 influenced your thinking about financial inclusion globally and nationally? And what do you see as some of the priorities for supervisors in this space under these difficult circumstances? No, I think that the COVID-19 experience has made it more important for us in terms of the digitization of the Ghanaian economy. This has been a major priority of the government and particularly in the area of digital payments. The Bank of Ghana has been at the forefront where from a branchless bank uh, guidelines, we have now have a full payments and services act which allows for fintechs to be licensed to participate in the payments uh, systems uh, landscape. Uh, as I said earlier on, mobile money is one of the areas that we have made uh, a lot of improvements. It's a major form of uh, payment in, in Ghana. Uh, most of our informal operators uh, operate using mobile money. And we have seen the mobile money transactions nearly double during this period that we have had a lockdown in, 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 in Accra and, and the major cities in the country. At the same time, we had seen cash, cash transactions uh, go down. So it, it became very clear to us what the substitution between you know, cash and, and, and digital payments, obviously because the cash itself was seen as a source of risk as the virus can be transmitted uh, through, through cash. So we are focusing very much on our, our digital agenda, trying to even make it more inclusive and allow that to rope in a lot more of informal market operators. This also takes the form of, uh, in a sense, a gender dimension because most of the participants in the informal sectors are market women, are women who do not normally have access to, to banks and do not normally have access to products of banks. So now that we using the mobile technology, we are beginning to see a lot more uh, access uh, of women uh, and to finance. Uh, and, and therefore, some of the products that are being generated, uh, mobile credit, for example, which does not require credit, but based on the payment histories, seem to be doing well uh, to those that are targeted at women entrepreneurs. And, and I think that broadly, this is the, the impact on, on inclusion as we see it. And globally, we would need to move that into a space in which uh, we also begin to see merchant payments uh, becoming online and digital. That's a big uh, challenge that we have uh, back home 
year where we do not have a lot of online uh, payments for goods. And we are trying to encourage merchants to introduce uh, digital forms of selling their, their goods and services as well. So broadly, this is how I see the, the impact on, on financial inclusion. Uh, the access can be widened to informal sectors. And these informal sectors have a bias towards uh, the ability of women to get access to finance. Governor, these are uh, impressive initiatives and I commend you for meticulously approaching this matter. I do know that from our activities and involvement in Ghana with uh, regulatory authorities, there's a very high degree of professionalism there. In fact, some of our trainers are folks that we trained in Ghana and now are helping us train other countries. So, you know, this is, this is fantastic to hear. Um, Chris, uh, turning to you, what are the main projects uh, the Gates Foundation is leading under the Financial Services for the Poor project? And why did you pick these focus areas? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, at the Gates Foundation, uh, we believe that every person deserves the chance to lead a healthy and productive life. And when Bill and Melinda set up the foundation, they wanted to address those things that make it harder to lead a healthy and productive life, including by addressing inequities in health and medicine, education, as well as economic growth and opportunity, and especially for women and girls around the world. And there's a growing body of research, Babak, that shows that when you have access to appropriate digital financial tools, you're better enabled to lift yourself out of poverty. And when crises struck, as you mentioned from the World Bank research that you've reviewed, you're more financially resilient. You and your family are, are less likely to backslide into poverty if you have access to appropriate tools. And the most powerful tools for financial inclusion in many countries have been digital payments platforms. And so we focus on three areas in particular to promote digital financial inclusion of women, the poor, and the unbanked. And so the first area is that we emphasize the adoption of an appropriate regulatory framework that enables and properly supervises digital financial services. And so we provide advice to supervisors and we sponsor research into enabling regulations such as licensing, customer onboarding, the role of agent networks, as I mentioned earlier, as well as consumer protection. We also look more broadly at the wider range of prudential and supervisory issues that countries uh, should consider as they enable digital financial inclusion. And in fact, together with several partners, including the World Bank and the United Nations, uh, diff different agencies with the United Nations, we recently published our reference guide for regulators on supervisory topics related to innovation and financial inclusion, which is meant to give broad insight into the types of questions and then a range of responses that different supervisors have adopted in different countries. The second area that we look at it and make grants in is in the digital infrastructure of a country. And there are two aspects in particular. One of the biggest blockers of inclusion in many countries is the lack of identity. And what that means is that in many countries, the poor and marginalized groups, including women, especially women, uh, may lack access to the documents that you and I have to prove who we are. Those are things like birth certificates or driver's licenses and passports. But with digital identities, it's possible for them to demonstrate who they are, and it's easier for them to be able to access financial service accounts. And so, as you may know, and traditionally under customer due diligence requirements, you'd need to bring us a full set of documentation to prove who you are. And many poor people don't have those types of documents. But the Financial Action Task Force, the global standard setting body for anti-money laundering, has recognized that a an overly strict approach to customer due diligence can lead to exclusion of the poor. And since about 2012, they've encouraged supervisors to think about risk adjusted approaches to those standards, including the use of what's called simplified due diligence when you're looking at low risk but vulnerable consumers uh, in terms of opening accounts for them. And so simplified due diligence is, is one of the areas that we look at in, in identity, as well as thinking about how to promote modern digital identity systems in response to research into design choices that governments can consider. And we have an open source platform as well that we have developed with other partners that could be the, form the basis of a modern digital identity system. The other side of the digital infrastructure is looking at the payment systems itself, and we advocate for the adoption of modern payment systems that will enable the use of a digital payments by the poor. And we have developed uh, an open source payments platform called MojaLoop, based on a Swahili word for one or together. And MojaLoop is a reference architecture for supervisors and for financial institutions to look at and to consider adopting or to look at the principles that make it possible for people with very low value accounts to make small transactions uh, in a modern financial system. 
And so we advocate very strongly on behalf of these interoperable digital payments platforms and recently announced a very exciting partnership with Google and with other technology providers and donors to promote more research and support for these types of digital platforms that are interoperable and open to the poor. And finally, the last area that I've emphasized that we focus on are all the use cases for digital financial services. Having a financial account that lies dormant most of the year probably isn't improving your life or making, making it possible for you, you lead, to lead a healthy and productive life. And so we want to make sure that there are lots of good uses for financial services when they're offered in country. So we encourage and sponsor research and experiments into digitizing wages for workers. We encourage governments to consider making social welfare payments to their citizens using digital means to reduce, uh, to increase efficiency and reduce corruption and ensure that people receive the payments that they are due. And we encourage merchants and the development of merchants acceptance networks for digital payments so that it's easier for people to make use of digital cash and easier for farmers to bring their products to market and receive payments uh, digitally when, when those things exist. Thanks, Chris. These are certainly a comprehensive array of uh, uh, services and activities that you are working on and Gates is doing. But it's interesting, given where we come from, it's very refreshing for me to hear the perspective and the words that you're using for supervision. I feel like we don't need to use Google Translate to talk to one another as one supervisory training agency to, to someone. from. So to that extent, the Gates Foundation should be commended to have someone like you with that expertise there. And I wanna point out that IMF research suggests that risks to financial stability increase when access to credit is expanded without proper regulation and supervision. Therefore, investing in high quality supervision can pay big dividends as financial inclusion expands. So obviously the, the veracity of this statement for the mission of Toronto Center is self-evident, but it's, it's very useful to hear that echoes of this also exist in some of the things that you were talking about. Governor, coming back to you, <clears throat> according to the World Bank, despite an increase in overall access to financial services, women are less financially included than men. Ghana, for example, fall, falls far behind global standards. Could you please tell us how you are addressing this issue at the central bank and what are the main challenges in enhancing financial inclusion uh, in Ghana? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I think that the issue of women's access to finance, it's a broader one. And the issues that you use to address them tends to be, in a sense, cross-cutting. I mean, the, the reasons for women not being able to uh, have bank accounts, some of them are sociocultural, uh, depending on which part of the world in which you are, uh, women have different rights uh, than men. And I think the same argument can be brought into the, the Ghanaian context, where women do not own, own most of the easiest collaterals such as houses and the type of assets that banks would require in order to to extend the loan so we have been working broadly first to try to gather the data that the banks are beginning to submit uh, gender disaggregated data and then on the basis of the gender disaggregated data that we have we will be able to uh, more carefully you know craft uh, programs which would go to uh, benefit women broadly. But the traditional collaterals, uh, we are dealing with it through promoting digitization, digital forms of credit, which would require that women uh, do not have to uh, produce the more difficult forms of collateral. We are also trying to simplify the issue of identity. Uh, Typically, the identity problem for women tends to be higher. So we are looking at uh, simplified PYC arrangements, looking at uh, tiered uh, arrangements for identification, and also, in a sense, uh, trying to put into place simplified uh, frameworks for the, for the banks in order to uh, be able to assess lending to women. So these are the main issues that we face in terms of uh, the issue of women, uh, which I say has to be cross-cutting in terms of, of the approach, because there are several reasons that account for that. Women are depending on men for, 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 for their living, and, and that dependence also, in a sense, 
uh, does not allow them to be able to uh, independently access credit. There is the issue of limited literacy for women. Women are not uh, fully literal compared to men. And then the, the lack of products and services that are also designed to, to help women. And for us, I think that the database that we are putting together would very much help us in trying to design products and services which would, would be most appealing to women. Thank you very much. And, uh, and we also always try to apply a gender lens to the activities that we do. And it is very unfortunate that we were not able to have a woman speaker at today's session. It wasn't due to lack of trying, but uh, we will rectify that. So uh, that's something that we are very much cognizant of. And Governor, thank you very much for elaborating on that. Uh, Chris, this, I'm going to pose this question to you, then we go to the audience, uh, <clears throat> because there's quite a lot of interesting questions there. Uh, together with partner organizations, Financial Services for the Poor program has developed a reference guide as a public good to assist regulators who are exploring policy options for enabling the development of inclusive digital financial services. I believe you alluded to this in one of your earlier answers. Have you received any feedback from supervisors on how helpful is this document? Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to address that. If I might just add on to some of the issues that Governor Abson mentioned about the financial inclusion of women. Uh, of the 1.7 billion people in the world who are financially excluded today, about 1 billion are women and, and many of them are based in Africa. And so the initiatives that Governor Addison mentioned are so important because countless studies show that when we give women access to financial services and they have their own account, it's a win-win for everyone. Women who have access to their own accounts are more likely to, to spend more on nutrition and the education needs of their families and, and their children. And that leads to better health and education outcomes for both boys and girls. And interestingly, research also shows that when women have access to accounts, they increase their stature in their families and in their communities as decision makers, and they're more likely to gain formal, to, to seek formal employment in the economy. Uh, and so it's a fascinating development. We could spend most of our time focusing on women and we would achieve most of the results that we want in financial inclusion. With regard to the reference guide, thank you so much for mentioning that. This is a document that we had developed with partner organizations who, uh, because we were meeting often with central bank staff or regulators in countries who had questions about what is the range of practice, what are some examples of good regulatory uh, policies that different countries have adopted. And we decided that we would collaborate to do some research on the basic questions that many regulators face and then offer insight into a range of practice of actual regulations that have been adopted in different markets and offer some insight into how well those have worked in terms of the impact on access to accounts and improvement of access to services for many different groups, including women. And so this reference guide looks at everything from the basic enabling environment, that is, who is licensed to provide financial services, um, how do you onboard consumers for the first time into financial services, how do you supervise the agent network that I talked about, those third parties to provide basic cash in and cash out services, and what can you do to improve the protection of consumers, many of whom are new to financial services, and as Governor Addison mentioned, may be illiterate, and in some cases, in some of the communities we work in, they may also be innumerate and unable to read or understand numbers, and so this is, these are very important considerations when you're thinking about the population. But the reference guide also covers a much wider range of topics, looking at the full range of predictions issues that supervisors and central bankers think about when they open their markets to digital financial services, including things like what are capital and liquidity standards? How do you monitor for uh, money laundering issues and prevent money laundering and terrorist financing and fraud? Um, what can we do to secure these uh, nascent systems against cyber attacks and so on? And so this is a, a first iteration of this document. It's available on the Gates Foundation website. It's called the Reference Guide for Regulators. It's meant to be a highly accessible and highly visual document. So it's not at all a traditional regulatory document like that you and I are used to. It's got lots of graphs and diagrams and so on to make it very easy. Um, and it's not a standalone reference guide either. You, you do need to do additional reading and we provide links to a number of other resources out there that our partners have developed and, and to actual central bank websites and so on for regulations. The, the feedback uh, from the initial use of this document in our meetings and technical assistance missions was highly favorable. And when we showed it to academics and to regulators and international financial institutions as well, they all asked if they could have copies. And that's why we decided to make this public. It's the uh, 1.0 version right now. And so we are seeking input and suggestions from people about things that we could improve or things that we could cover differently and better. And so we're eager to receive feedback on it. 
thank you very much, Chris. And uh, if feedback from us is welcome, we'll be happy to take a look at it and also provide you with some of that. So let's uh, go to the audience. And I see a number of uh, very interesting questions. Uh, first, a statement of uh, praise from Habib Cabo, who liked one of our previous sessions. It says today is another rich experience being shared. So thank you very much, uh, Habib. Appreciate it. And I bet you the critical comments are going into my email. So I'd like to read the ones that are coming here forward. Uh, Governor, let me pose this question to you. What is the Central Bank of Ghana doing to ensure that financial inclusion drive in Ghana is sustained in the midst of COVID-19? So in other words, how do you make sure that COVID-19 doesn't just erase all the gains that you've had? No, well, I think that the, the digital agenda broadly is a priority for this government. And we are ensuring that uh, we continue with our policies in that sector, particularly the, the setting up of digital infrastructure, improving the network and connectivity, as well as looking at the issue of costs, really, and which impacts on access to digital services. We have had to uh, come out with a schedule for financial intermediaries in terms of uh, trying to minimize the cost of transfers, for example. And we have put in a range of values for which the banks and other specialized deposit institutions do, do not charge anything at all. I think that is where the, the biggest gain is. If we are able to manage the cost associated with the use of mobile money, for example, that should help us sustain the interest uh, of the non-excluded, I mean, non-included in, in the financial services. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, Chris, this question is specifically for you. You're actually mentioned by name in that question. So one of the fallouts in India due to this pandemic is the dislocation of huge numbers of migrant workers. Please share your thoughts, comments on how this impacts uh, banking needs while people are constantly on the move. Uh, some, on the, some of them on foot. Uh, do you have any insights that you can share on this? Yes, the pandemic has led to a large number of people returning home to their countries because they can no longer work in the communities in which they used to work, whether that's in India or beyond. And that's true, not just in India, but also in other countries as well. So there is a mass migration taking place of people who are highly vulnerable, who lived day to day on wages that they would earn uh, in the informal sector sometimes in many cases. And that's why programs like the cash transfers uh, are likely to be quite important in many countries going forward to help close the gap in the lost income and wages. And it may also help to reinforce physical distancing requirements if families have access to some resources to help uh, meet their daily needs so that they're not forced to work uh, and expose themselves as much in the, um, in, in the open uh, to the virus. And we think that cash transfers are gonna to continue to be an important part of the responses in many countries to the pandemic. And that's why we think that wherever possible, these should be done digitally. And, and that's why we emphasize enrolling as many people as possible, as Governor Addison mentioned, into financial services accounts, using appropriate measures, like things like super, simplified due diligence to prevent problems that could emerge. And these types of digital transfers are very safe. Uh, it's much more effective, it's often much more efficient. It costs a lot less rather than have, as you said, have the army say deliver cash house to house or have people gather in crowds outside of government offices or bank branches. And so cash transfers are gonna be an important part of that solution. But digital financial services themselves may also be part of the solution in these cases. If it's easy for me to make a payment to a friend or a parent who might be in need of help uh, and that person lives very far from me, Digital financial services make that so much easier and, and make it easy for me to sort of leverage my friends and family network, if you will, and, and bridge my needs or help others bridge their needs. And so that, that support can also be quite helpful to families and to individuals. But it's a very big challenge and it's one that I encourage supervisors and central bankers to think about as well. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that. And uh, this, this next question is uh, from one of our colleagues, uh, Loretta Michaels. Before I ask her a question, I'm really glad she's on. And the last one, the last episode, so I compared the two speakers that we had favorably to Jack Nicholson, the American actor who only has one speed. And I don't think Loretta liked that. So I, my apologies to Loretta on that. And I do think he's a great actor. So coming back to your question, has uh, Ghana Central Bank taken any measures specifically aimed at non-bank financial institutions like uh, microfinance institutions? 
Yes, we have taken a lot of measures uh, with the non-bank institutions. Uh, some of them had, you know, minimum requirements, secondary requirements, which we have reduced. Uh, we've also reduced the the reserve requirements for rural banks uh, in, in Ghana also. So all of this is to help improve liquidity that is available to these uh, other financial institutions like rural banks, savings and loan societies. And the Bank of Ghana has also set up uh, a liquidity support arrangement where the bank would be uh, making liquidity available uh, on the basis of collateral to these institutions if they face any tightness in, in, in liquidity. And at, at the same time, we've also been promoting uh, some kind of arrangement between the mobile money companies and, and, and the microfinance institutions to give out microcredit. And uh, we have had a, the JUMO arrangement in Ghana, which has over 2 million customers that are being saved digitally uh, credit, over 2 million customers in, in the last few years. And these are customers that are, in a sense, remotely being able to access credit at a much lower cost. Um, Chris, I'm going to pass this question to you. It's an interesting question. Looks like the questioner uh, has a logical way of looking at things, a uh, logic frame. Is there a correlation between countries with high banked rates and those who trust their governments? So high bank rate trust government. And is there a correlation between countries with low bank rates and those who do not trust their government? If so, are there different strategies for countries with high versus low trust? Is this something that uh, you've been looking at at the foundation and others within the financial inclusion community? So at the foundation, we haven't studied this particular issue to my knowledge. Uh, it is an important one because financial services are all about trust and you want to ensure that people trust the people uh, that they're entrusting, that, that, that they're sending their savings to, and that they can trust that the systems will work well for them. And so things like consumer protection regimes are so important, especially when you're introducing new consumers to financial services who may not understand what their rights and responsibilities are. And so things like transparency in terms of pricing and fees that consumers may pay make it easier for the consumers to understand what obligations and rights they may have and how the system will work for them if they open an account. And likewise, having a good means of addressing complaints and having a, making clear how financial institutions are required to receive complaints from consumers and if those aren't resolved, what access to redressal they may have and, and to help from other uh, organizations, whether the civil society or the central bank or consumer protection agency and so on. These are all important measures to promoting trust in financial services, because at the end of the day, financial services is a lot about confidence in the financial system. And if you don't trust the system, you won't want to use an account. And that doesn't then serve the needs that we that we have in terms of trying to get people access to good tools that will help them improve their lives and, and to lead healthy lives as well. Very true. So without trust, uh, money is just a piece of paper or just a bit of information, right? Exactly. I would add that no, no matter how much capital a bank or a, a financial system may have, all of that is eroded if consumers don't trust the system. Yeah. And it also ties back into some of the earlier things you were talking about, the fact about mobile operators and others who are coming, which is great. They're expanding access. Uh, but it does beg the question, and I don't necessarily want to open that uh, that gate, but uh, does beg the question of fiduciary responsibility, it does beg the question of like, who is at the end of the day looking after the stability of the system? Is it the central banks or is it some other entity that might be regulated, but then their financial activity is not regulated, right? So these are very interesting interrelated questions in the rush to provide access to people, which is very legitimate. These broader questions obviously have to remain very much at the front, for, forefront of our mind. Governor, I'm going to pass this question on to you. It's not just about Ghana. It's actually a global question. But I think you, based on your network of uh, central bankers around the world and the fact that you have worked in international organizations and are uh, in charge of the, uh, you know, the monetary policy in your country, you may have a view on this to help us out. It's a question about equity, in a sense. During any type of crisis, whether it be pandemic, natural, or financial, the humanity at lower socioeconomic scale, minorities, marginalized populations, and the poor are impacted the most. However, time and time again, 
90% of the efforts are directed at capital markets. Why is that? Well, I, I'm not sure whether that is entirely correct. I mean, if you look at the response to this pandemic, we are focused on the big macro issues. And then we have also focused on the micro and household issues. I mean, if you look at the global responses, this has been targeted at capital markets, interest rate policy responses, etc. in terms of, you know, the ability to stabilize markets and, and redirect investment and capital flows. That's important at the macro level. But then at the micro level, we have had governments institute all types of programs, particularly to deal with those segments of society that are more vulnerable. Coming to our part of the world, a lot of the government response has been in trying to feed the poor. There has been cash transfer programs that are directed at people whose livelihoods have been disrupted. We have had a lot of other interventions which are aimed particularly at the, at the less, you know, less endowed in society. And we've seen a lot of the uh, interventions that the government has put into place looking at directing this issue of equity. So my broader response to that is that I, I do not agree. I think that we have had a balance, a balance of addressing the big macro issues that are associated with capital flows, as well as uh, uh, with a focus on, on the micro part of the problem. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a good question coming from one of our board members, which starts with great webinar exclamation mark. So, you know, as the CEO of Toronto Center, I'm very grateful for that kind of an opening from one of our board members, but it's an interesting question. Should global standard setters like the Basel Committee, IIS, IOSCO, or even the FSB play a more involved role in promoting financial inclusion? Chris, let me pass this on to you. They already are playing a role in promoting financial inclusion. So under the leadership of Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, who serves as the United Nations Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, uh, she has convened meetings regularly at the Bank for International Settlements with the major standard setting bodies, including many of the ones that you mentioned, as well as FATF, to talk about how global standards affect financial inclusion. Uh, we know that in this past, a very strict application of things like know your customer rules or customer due diligence could lead to exclusion and FATF to its credit has recognized that challenge many years ago and has encouraged countries to adopt risk-based approaches that may be more appropriate for their local circumstances and that might consider the needs of including citizens in their, in their financial system while also respecting the fact that they are potentially lower risk and, and they're very small transactions, so less risk of things like money laundering taking place. And it's the same could be true for the other standard setting bodies as well. And many of them have written papers on how standards affect financial inclusion and how regulators and central bankers can think much more about financial inclusion. And there's some research, and I'd like to see more, but there's some research that suggests that when more of a population is included, it's easier for central banks to carry out their functions of promoting sound monetary policy and ensuring that the payment systems works well and so on. Like I said, there, there's more research that could be done here, and I'd like to see much more research done on the link between, say, inclusion and stability. But there is some research that suggests that. But more broadly, the research is hugely compelling that when people have access to appropriate digital financial services, they are more likely to be able to lift themselves out of poverty, and when they're out of poverty, less likely to backslide into it because their financial resilience increases. Just as when we increase the capital reserves for banks, they're better able to weather storms. When people have access to good financial tools and the ability to borrow and save and to make payments to each other and, and to participate more fully in the economy, they're less likely to backslide and they have greater financial resilience as well. So the standard setters play an incredibly important role here as do standards implementers, central banks and regulators. And I'm delighted that there's been a very good dialogue, including at the Bank for International Settlements, as well as at FATF and other organizations and other center setting bodies. Well, Chris, you're a, definitely a scholar and a gentleman, because if I was going to answer that question, I would, uh, you know, take off with some of the things you said. But in our experience, sometimes we see two silos, financial inclusion and financial stability, and sometimes they don't really interrelate together. So probably more could be done. But I'm glad to hear that uh, the efforts that they have taken and the goodwill that they're showing is beginning to uh, affect some change here. Uh, Governor, uh, a question specifically for you. Uh, what are 
the specific strategies implemented by your central bank to popularize digital payments and increase awareness on risks of using digital payments amongst the low income groups of the society? Well, as I said, digital payments are a major part of the policy of the country broadly. I mean, Ghana is implementing a national identification program where there is going to be a biometric issue of a national ID, which contains the information of almost everybody in the country. In addition to that, we are also pursuing a national digital property addressing system that also is also aimed at digitizing the economy. Thirdly, we have designed a tired KYC arrangement to minimize compliance challenges also in the country. And as I said earlier on, we have a new Payments and System Services Act, which allows us to license fintechs. So currently we have received several applications from many promoters that are trying to register fintech, fintech organizations in the country. And these fintechs are working in collaboration with the banks to develop different types of applications that will simplify digital payments. Especially we do have the mobile money arrangements and interoperability between the, the mobile money and bank accounts and what we call the e-switch account, which is a central bank inspired project. We call that the financial inclusion triangle. So in Ghana at the moment, if you have a bank account and you have an e-switch card and you have a mobile phone, you can have interoperability between your mobile phone and the bank account as well as the e-switch card. And, and all of that, in a sense, brings in a lot of uh, uh, the people in this country who are not in the cities, in the rural areas, who have access to mobile phones, are automatically able to be roped into the banking system because once they have a mobile money account, these mobile money accounts can be replicated using a banking account and opening a banking account uh, for, for that mobile money account. And we think that this is the way in which we will sustain interest in, in digital payments broadly, but also to promote all of this uh, agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, we're coming pretty close to the end, but Chris, I'm gonna ask you to please take a stab at this question. Is there any immediate, immediate palliative in any form for microfinance institutions in developing countries to ameliorate the effect of COVID-19? Because obviously a lot of them are in panic, they may not be able to exist. Is there anything that you see certain governments do or incentives to keep these institutions afloat? Yeah, that's a challenging question. And I should emphasize that we don't focus a, a great deal of our uh, work on microfinance institutions. We do work with some, and we do have some uh, insight into these types of issues. I think, first of all, I would look to the responses of many central banks and supervisory authorities in the early weeks of the pandemic, and that was to get information out to the institutions about the health and safety measures that they needed to take and about the need for physical distancing. And then, as I mentioned, in many cases, governments are trying to get soap and and water to branches and to agents and so on so that consumers who come to make deposits or to with make withdrawals and so on can wash their hands before engaging in those types of things. So first access to that information. I think a second thing that I would emphasize is uh, we'd like to see more investment in thinking about liquidity in branches and liquidity of agents. And with modern technology, it seems like it should be relatively straightforward to be able to keep track of, say, where an agent is located, because sometimes these people change their locations. They might be individuals standing on an umbrella who sell airtime and will also uh, take, take deposits from consumers uh, for these mobile money accounts, these very small accounts. And uh, with better technology, and, and we have some experiments in the field currently, uh, it would be easier for providers to monitor the liquidity of these agents and for central banks better to have a better insight into those things. So those are the things that I would emphasize is thinking a little bit about the health and safety measures as well as understanding better the state of liquidity. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, we're coming to the end almost. I would like to thank you very much for being articulate, concise, and thoughtful which really made my job very easy. You were very generous with your time and very complete with your answers. So thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, interviewing you. To our audience, uh, my apologies for leaving some questions on the table, that's inevitable, but uh, your questions will not go to waste. Uh, 
these webinars are very important to us in a sense that not only they help raise awareness of the audience, but also uh, our multi-stakeholder audience, but also they provide important input into our capacity building courses. So we will try to work with your questions in one form or another as we enhance the quality of our offerings, whether they're courses, whether they're guidance notes or things of that nature. And for those of you in the supervisory community, I know a lot of you have questions about business continuity plans and would like to improve them. Please visit crisis at torontocenter.org. We do have dedicated uh, communities of practice for business continuity plan, financial inclusion and others to enhance the dialogue amongst the supervisors and, and uh, tie you to various activities and initiatives that will be helpful to you. So Chris and Governor, thank you again. I really appreciate thank your time. You. And thank you. Thank yeah. you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. A real pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Bob Beck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.